Let's go ahead and start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this day and opportunity to be together. Thank you for uh, the fruits of this week, uh, the way that uh, we've been able to be challenged to grow in your love, the way we live it, uh, the way we receive it and know it. I pray especially tonight for uh, good discerning in our minds. Help us to know your wisdom, your truth. Help us to live it with conviction. And we pray especially for honesty and courage where it is needed. We pray for your healing and forgiveness where it is needed. Above all, we pray that we can continue to draw deeper into your heart, to know your love, and to live it. We ask all this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, happy to be with you tonight to wrap up the Busy Person Retreat, come to conclusion here. Uh, there's a couple of aspects of this uh, talk that to me are, um, I would say, pretty unique to my life, my role that I'm in. Uh, I feel like I'm uh, helping people a lot with uh, this kind of discernment. Uh, not always romantic friendships sometimes, uh, but friendships in general. How do you know if a friendship is good or not? And if it's not good, how do you know how to get out of it? So that's one of the things that I wanted to just run through with you this evening. Uh, I've got just a couple of slides, and then I'll, I'm going to move over to uh, kind of my flow chart. And then we'll hit back to the slides uh, just to get a little bit. So these two, I don't, this is like my only picture I have of questionable uh, friend behavior. So uh, I popped it in there. Uh, they're actually, actually really close friends. <laughs> All right, so when I start with, uh, I always want to start with a basic question. I'm going to take a friendship and I'm going to uh, take an honest look at it because uh, i got to know where I am to start with. i got to know if this is a good thing. If it's good, then I want to grow it. If it's not good, then I want to figure out either how to change it or how to get out of it. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But so for me, my first, and by the way, I try to keep almost all these questions yes, no, because I want it to be as simple as it can be, right? Uh, if it's a yes, no question, I found in my experience, most people can answer it. If I say, is this a good friendship? Most people can say yes or no. If I start saying, well, how good is it? Or how fruitful is it? Then it's hard to answer sometimes. But is it good or not? Most people can say yes or no to start with. Um, we'll walk through that together. And then there'll be some time at the end for questions if you want to ask sp uh, specific questions about either a unique uh, situation or, or anything in general. So, is this a good friendship? Uh, my first question always, is this a good friendship? And for me, that, what that means is, are both hearts growing? Uh, is there some part of your life together, this relationship together, that strengthens you both, that helps both of your hearts to be growing? Uh, if it's going to be a good friendship, that has to be true. Uh, is there a mutual inspiration and support? Is there something that you see in each other that helps you to be better? Uh, sometimes uh, we find that relationships are a little out of balance. Uh, one person might be supporting a lot, the other person not very much. Uh, so we have to make some corrections. We'll come to that in just a minute. So here's Kayla and Bob. Uh, do you remember them? Rob, by the way, yeah, I want to welcome uh, back one of our alumni here, Rob Johnson. He's a seminarian with the Diocese of Springfield. One of my best sons. It's good to have him back here. Um, so uh, Kayla and Bob, you know, this, was, this would have been the kind of discernment we would have gone through, right? Is this a good friendship? Are both hearts growing? The answer is yes. Uh, they both found in each other a kind of inspiration. That classic, uh, the way it should work in a good friendship, that classic growth. Uh, he, through his friendship with her, decides... I want to be a better man, right? I'm going to work for it. I'm going to start going to, to Mass more. I'm going to work on my holiness. I'm going to work on uh, growing as a man. Uh, for her, on her part, she says, uh, when, yeah, when we're together, I'm inspired to continue to grow, to deepen my relationship with God, and to be more of service to others. And so you see that. There's a mutual growth that happens there. That's how you know the fruitfulness. That's how you know you want to keep going. Uh, here's a, a couple of uh, bullets for defining a true friendship. Uh, it should be morally helpful to both. Uh, if it's not, then we're talking about something else. It might be some kind of interaction, some kind of relationship. If it's not morally helpful to both, it can't be a, fruit, a true friendship. Uh, there also has to be a genuine basis of agreement. There's got to be something in common. We're, the, the classic phrase is opposites attract, right? But uh, if you're total opposites, 
and you're going to be in trouble. There's got to be some kind of a mutual foundation point to grow from. And then there has to be this kind of self-sacrifice, this generosity that pours forth in the relationship. If it's always about taking, if it's always about pleasure, if it's always about getting what I want or getting my satisfaction, then we know we're, we're not talking about a true friendship. A true friendship is characterized by this self-sacrifice, this generosity in which I give myself so that the other person's life is better. So we judge this true friendship according to those, um, according to those bullets. Uh, a couple quotes here. Uh, if it leads to sin, it is not a true friendship. I love you, so let's go to hell together. That doesn't make sense. If I love you, I want what's best for you. I want your heart to be happy and fulfilled. Uh, hell is the absence of any fulfillment at all. Right? Hell is total uh, isolation and desolation. Uh, if I love a person, I could never want that for them. And so I can't act in a way that would put them in danger, that would lead them in that direction. If I'm doing that, then it's not a true friendship. Uh, this is Father Gerald Carroll. This is a great, I found this book, by the way, uh, written in the 40s. And uh, I picked it up. It's, um, it's a book written for uh, teenagers on uh, chastity. And I was like, what, what kind of book is this going to be? From the 40s, Teenagers and Chastity. There's this great chapter in there, actually, about relationships uh, breaking up. And uh, he has this quote in there. People ought to prepare for marriage intelligently. It might seem obvious. But I'm going to tell you in my experience, I've done over 100 weddings. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't prepare for marriage very intelligently. Uh, sometimes they uh, have this whole thing laid out and they're just going to live it without actually thinking about the kind of life it's going to be or thinking about how they're going to try to grow or what kind of family life they're going to have. Uh, this is honest truth. I've had people sitting in my office, you know, a few weeks away from a wedding who are still uh, had never talked about... Um, how many children they were going to have, or where they were going to live, or whether or not both were going to work, or if one was going to stay home. Uh, those are important questions, and uh, they, they do have to be uh, brought up uh, during that preparation. But I throw this in there because sometimes we get caught up in relationships. What we end up doing is we hang on for the sake of hanging on. And the reality is, is that it's not a fruitful friendship. It's not one where both are growing. It's not one that's producing fruit. And so we have to be intelligent about that. We have to be reasonable about that in terms of understanding what's best for us. Uh, this is the Arinello family. They prepared for marriage very intelligently. Uh, I put them on as a good example. Um, this is kind of a, a, a very classic story. Um, I knew, I've known Bridget for a long time. Uh, she had uh, a very concrete idea of the kind of life that she was going to live. Uh, she had it all laid out. I don't know if there's anybody like that in this room. Uh, she had everything figured out. She had a time frame. She had a family situation. She had her roles. Everything was done. There's only one problem with that. She hadn't met the fellow yet, right? Uh, now, when Teddy came along, he was uh, a good man. Uh, we were able to kind of uh, work on matching her plan, her dreams, to the reality uh, that he helped uh, bring about. So, Actually, uh, they're doing great. They just uh, had their second child. They're really happy. All right, so I want to do some yes, no questions that are going to help us figure out, is this a good friendship or not? You can tell I'm a little light on my bad friendship pictures, right? So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, on the left represents uh, my yes, it's a good friendship. On my right, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So we're going to do some yes, no questions. So as I mentioned, I always start here in the middle. I always start, is this a genuine friendship? Are both hearts growing? And the answer is yes or no. And depending on uh, what we say to that, we're going to go to some more questions. So we'll do the good side first. We'll do the yes side first, all right? So are both hearts growing? Yes, we're going to do Andy and Gina. We're going to say yes, both hearts are growing. Okay, so we're going to go over to this side. So the next yes, no question, if both hearts are growing... My next question is, do I want to deepen this friendship, right? So both hearts are growing right now. There's some kind of mutual support. There's some kind of inspiration. There's some kind of accountability, whatever it is. And it's going okay. My question is, honestly, do I want to deepen this thing? Do I want to grow more? Sometimes the answer is going to be, yeah, I would love to. And so I'm going to invest more time. 
I'm going to get to the heart of this person, right? I'm going to go deeper. We're going to go from maybe surface level knowledge, basic background stuff, general likes, interests. We're going to go from that level to a little bit deeper. The, the, the questions in that deeper level start to become things like, um, yeah, like, what do you dream about? What is important to you? Uh, what are your goals? Uh, how do you interact with God? How do you pray? What, do you, what kind of prayer do you do? Uh, deeper into the heart of the person. Let's say you get to that question, though, and you say, boy, this really costs a lot. Uh, I do kind of want to deepen this friendship, but uh, it takes me away from my studies too much. Or uh, it takes me away from other relationships that I'd rather have instead. Or somehow um, it's interfering with... um, Maybe, you know, my, my relationship with my family or whatever. If we realize, honestly, that it starts to cost too much, then I want to put a cap on where this relationship is, right? So I say, keep it casual. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having just a casual interaction with people. Um, in, in my life, there's uh, quite a few guys, uh, priests, that I know really well in, in our diocese, Diocese of Peoria. I know him really well. And so I could start here and I could say, is this a good friendship? Are both hearts growing? I say, yeah. You know, I see in that guy a kind of uh, encouragement. I see him working hard. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Uh, There's some mutual encouragement there. And so I could ask the question, do I want to deepen this friendship? Well, in one case I might say, yeah, I do actually. He's got some uh, incredible uh, prayer life that would be helpful to me. And hopefully, uh, the way I live my life, the way I interact with people, the way I help hearts grow could be helpful to him. So that mutual helpfulness, we're going to keep growing. We're going to have those deep conversations. Uh, but what if I start going and all of a sudden, all he wants to do is talk about, you know, the, the school finances and uh, hours and hours of school finances. And I start to say to myself, this cost me too much, right? I don't have hours to talk about some school finances of a school that I don't even know about, right? So I'm realizing that there's a limit to this relationship. If that's all he wants to do, is talk about school finances, then this is not a guy that I can have as a really close friend. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, but let's go, let's go back to the good part. I do want to invest time. Um, this guy that I know, uh, he really, uh, the way that he understands God the Father, and the way that He understands how the Father loves us is inspiring. I want to keep growing. I want to keep going deeper. So the question is, do you make it exclusive? Now, lots of times we think of that in terms of specifically a romantic relationship, but that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, There's lots of relationships that are exclusive that are not romantic, right? Uh, An exclusive relationship is one where you have your own kind of uh, understanding with each other, maybe your own language or lingo. Uh, Sometimes... Uh, you even have like uh, a particular way of interacting, right? I could say, you know, Rob Johnson and I, we have an exclusive relationship. It's a unique one to us. Uh, there's lots of other priests in his life. Uh, I've got other spiritual sons. But the way that we interact together is unique. We've got a unique history. Uh, we've got some stories that we share. We've got, in some ways, uh, a shared lingo, right? Uh, so in that sense, uh, it can be exclusive. There's something unique to us. Um, if you want to uh, go to that deeper level, then, then you continue to grow in knowledge and you grow in intimacy. This is where, as trust is growing, we're going to be sharing at a deeper level. Uh, there's things that, uh, as we've been growing together through the years, there's things that maybe Rob would share you know, later that in the beginning he never did, right? When we first started, he told that last fall, when we first started, he wasn't really interested in church and God and all that as much, right? So we just did some guy things, right? I taught him how to, to go on dates and things like that, right? So um, I guess you can judge if I'm good at it or not. Yeah. Okay. I put as a little sidebar here because I think this is important. Some relationships only work in groups. Uh, if, you, if you've got a friendship and you have this desire maybe to grow deeper but you keep kind of hitting snags where you, you realize that when you're alone, when it's just the two of you, all of a sudden, it's not the same. It feels awkward. It feels labored. It feels burdensome. Uh, to me, that's another important place to be honest. 
Maybe that's a friendship that really only works in groups. Some are like that. Um, I've got, um, Father Jim could, could attest to this, we've got this area priest dinner that happens uh, on Saturday nights. Uh, there's some conversation that happens in that group uh, that kind of keeps, keeps the flow going, right? And, and different guys chime in. They, they add their two cents. But in all honesty, I don't know how you feel about it, uh, there's a couple of guys in the group who if it was just one-on-one, -on -one, you'd be like, what do I talk about, right? We're going to talk about uh, Notre Dame sports or Illinois sports, you know, for 10 minutes. And now what am I going to talk about with this guy? I don't know. I don't know what's next. Some relationships really only work in groups. If there's five or six other guys around, I could talk all night. But if it's just the two of us, I don't know what to say. I, I, don't, I don't understand what this person, what's important to this person. I don't understand uh, what, what this person wants out of this conversation. That's a hard one sometimes to recognize in progress. But if you just take a step back and ask yourself, does this work better when we're in a crowd? Or is this okay when it's one-on-one? -on -one? Is there actually some fruitfulness or something deeper that happens one-on-one? -on -one? Um, that could be a really helpful question. Okay, once the friendship is growing, it's exclusive, it's just the two of you, it's a unique relationship, then the question is, do I have this friendship for life? Is this one that's going to really stay with me? Or is this one that is going to be maybe intense for a time, but maybe will fade later on? Um, we'll talk about it in just a, a little bit. Uh, a lot of friendships are really proximity-based. Uh, you're friends with who you're close to. Um, let's see, focus missionaries. We got Hannah here. Yeah, Hannah and Kanji. Kanji, you, uh, you, you've been growing in some friendships this year because you live here, right? And the truth is that someday you'll probably live somewhere else. You probably won't live in Champaign the rest of your life. Oh, maybe you will. <laughs> you do like it here? Yeah. Not your plans. But also, the nature of this place is that people are preparing to go somewhere else, right? So you're working with guys, you're friends with guys now who are probably going to go live somewhere else. And so a lot of friendships are proximity-based. While you're together, you'll be hanging out, you'll be doing stuff together, you'll be growing together. But once you leave, once you go somewhere else, then you develop new friendships in the place where you go. Some, fr some friendships are proximity-based. Others... They really do stay with you for life. Uh, it's been how many years, Rob, since you graduated? Six years. Six years. That's longer than some of these people have been alive. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Rob's been gone for six years, but we still keep in touch. Uh, here he is visiting tonight. Uh, we're going to hang out tomorrow. We're going to talk. Um, the friendship continues over time. There's adjustments that are made. We don't talk in the same way now that we did six years ago. Uh, but the friendship continues. As part of this question, I always ask a follow-up. Is this a friendship that I want to have for life? And if the answer is yes, then my follow-up is, do I trust this person totally? Right? Do I trust this person totally with my heart? Can I be vulnerable and know that this is not going to end up on YouTube? Right, Sister Loretta? <laughs> <laughs> can I be vulnerable? Can I, can I play guitar and sing in front of a group and know it's not going to be on YouTube? Do I trust totally? Mm, no. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that are uh, pursuing romantic relationships, this is the most important question. There's all kinds of questions, right? Uh, do we like the same things? Are we compatible? All, the, all that kind of stuff. This is the most important question. Do I trust this person totally? Do I know that this person is going to care for my heart? That this person is going to strive never to hurt me? That this person is always going to strive in generosity, in self-sacrifice, to build me up, to help me be who I'm supposed to be, ultimately, uh, to help me along the way to the kingdom? If the answer is yes to that, then see you in heaven, right? Full speed ahead. No turning back. If the answer is not a resounding yes, then we've got to be honest about where this thing is limited. Uh, this is probably one of the hardest things in a relationship. If you get to this level, you've got this exclusive level that's growing in, in intimacy, that's growing in knowledge, and you get pretty deep into this friendship, and you start thinking about a natural question. Am I going to have this friendship for life? Is this, are we going to get married? Are we going to be together forever? It's a very natural question as intimacy starts, to, intimacy starts to grow. It's the hardest question sometimes to answer in that moment, but the most important one. Do I trust this person totally with everything I've got? 
If the answer is not a resounding yes, then you're not ready to go further, right? Uh, at that, if the answer is not a resounding yes, then we got to either go back and work on strengthening certain parts or be honest about what the limit really is. Okay. Uh, when I was uh, dating Katie Schiffer, some of you heard me tell the story. Uh, when I was dating Katie Schiffer, all this was uh, just a resounding yes all the way down to get to this point. The trust was there, but what wasn't there was uh, an understanding of what God's will was for our lives and how together we were supposed to be living it out. Uh, it was almost all the way to this point uh, before we realized that there was something missing earlier on. And it, actually, it ended up coming back to, um, back to, the, to this knowledge of intimacy level. Um, God had laid out a different plan for both of us. And we needed to, first of all, understand it, but then also to be honest about it. And that's how we knew that there was a limit uh, to what our friendship could be. Okay. Uh, by the way, that kind of honesty can really always, uh, I think, save a friendship. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult or awkward when a friendship... Uh, when it's growing deeper and then you hit a cap, you realize it's not going to go further. Or when you run into trouble and realize, yeah, this is not good. Uh, I need to back it off. I need to go back to the casual level, whatever. Uh, that can be very difficult. But honesty and truth there can save it. If you can save it, that's the way to save it. Um, it's pretty cool for me. It's a great honor always to still have Katie and her family in my life. Uh, some of you heard me say that. I was a deacon at her wedding, baptized some of the kids. Um, it's pretty cool to be able to, to have that relationship. Uh, but it was really that honesty is what helped us uh, to get to preserve to that moment. Okay, now let's do the hard side. Is this a good friendship and are both hearts growing? Uh, okay, I'm going to say no. This is not, right? Uh, usually, most of the time, 95% of the time, uh, if a friendship, if both hearts are not growing, it's because it's out of balance. Usually one heart is growing and one heart is not growing, right? One person is giving and one person is taking. That's the, the old joke, right? Uh, we have a give and take relationship. I give and you take. Yeah. Um, almost always, if a friendship's in trouble, it's because it's out of balance. Somebody is taking something, the other person's giving, but that other, there's not a, a reciprocation. There's not a receiving back in the other direction. So if this thing's out of balance, uh, can we save it? Uh, so two questions. Can we save this thing if it's out of balance? Why is it out of balance, right? Uh, I'm going to go two ways. If it's destructive or abusive, then I'm going to say, have a nice life, right? Uh, if it's out of balance because one person is uh, always in selfishness, taking everything. If one person is uh, hurtful, taking out aggression, taking out frustration. Uh, if there's no seeking of the other's good, and that's an ongoing habit, uh, then I'm going to say have a nice life, right? If a person does not see enough of my goodness to understand uh, who I am and want to grow with me, to help me grow, if the person just wants to take out uh, anger, frustration, or hurt on me, then that's not a healthy situation for me to be in. Uh, I was, one time I was in one uh, uh, person, uh, I don't know if you'll notice this, sometimes priests are very careful about who gets their cell phone number because uh, it can be uh, kind of a difficult situation. I was in one one time where I had a person who uh, was texting me like 50 times a day. You know, I, I'm stressed out, I need this, I need this help, whatever, whatever. Uh, well, I mean, I realize, uh, hopefully all of you, I mean, I know probably a lot of you text a lot, but hopefully 50 times a day sounds like too much, right? Uh, it is, it's too much. Uh, we were in a, a situation which was, yeah, very unhealthy. If I did not respond to the message, then I got like 10 more. And if I didn't respond to the message in the way the person wanted, then I got like 10 more angry messages. Uh, it, was, it was very, uh, I would say, very destructive and very abusive. So uh, the only solution there is have a nice life. Uh, I am not the person to grow with you. I'm not the person to help you. You're not the person to grow with me. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but let's say that it's not. It's not that. It's just a little out of balance. One person maybe is just a little more needy or maybe one person um, has particular preferences for uh, growth. could be spiritual things. could also just be interests in entertainment. It's, it's not uncommon. Maybe one person is a little more assertive. Uh, they've got their likes. 
Uh, the other, the friend doesn't really like those things, but because that person's so assertive, they end up just kind of going along all the time. But ultimately, if we're honest about it, we'd see that those gifts and those needs, maybe, maybe they don't match very well. So what can we do? We can work on that. I can invest the time and the effort. I, I'm going to give what I can to fix this imbalance. Uh, if, say, I'm a person that is, I'm, I'm the kind of person that uh, always, at the end of the day, I got to de-stress, right? So I need to tell in minute detail uh, 150 things that happened today. I need to get it out. But let's say that's too burdensome for the other person. They've got a great capacity and interest in my life, but uh, the limit there is about 30 things. So uh, I need to make an adjustment. Can I find another outlet? Can I find another way to de-stress? Can that person's capacity increase a little bit? As our intimacy grows, as the investment grows, will that person take a greater interest in me? Uh, that's very normal. As a relationship deepens, you want to know more about the person. You want to know all the details. You want to know what are the burdens of the day. I want to know so that I can understand them, so that I can help you with them, that I can help you carry them. That's what a true friendship is. That's what, that's what a true friend does. So if the needs and match, if the needs and gifts don't match, can we grow that? Can we adjust that situation? Uh, if I'm willing to invest the time, if I'm willing to make the effort, then you keep going. If I find that there's nothing we can do here, we're incompatible, I can't, I can't fix this, then I'm going to say, have a nice life. All right? Let's say uh, I'm in a, a relationship with a person who uh, can only communicate by text message. And I'm a person who uh, I can do texting, I can get, uh, get a lot done that way. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, if I'm going to grow with a person, I want to see them face to face. We're going to talk together. We're going to sit and eat dinner together. We're going to look at each other. We're going to, uh, we're going to be able to have uh, nonverbal language together. Uh, if I've got a person who can't do that, then I'm going to say we're incompatible, right? Um, that's the honest truth. Actually, I had someone once uh, schedule time to meet with me and uh, sat there silent the whole time. I asked questions and there was no answer given. It was very awkward. Uh, you almost can't even do it. Even if you try, you can't do it, you know? I just feel like I want to try it. Can we try it, Jenny? Uh, don't answer my questions, whatever you do. Can we do that? Okay. Yeah. Jenny, how was your day today? Did, any, did anything exciting happen? Ah, her mouth's even opening like, ah! Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, being able to converse with somebody is at the core of the life that I'm living, the kind of father I am, the kind of ministry that God has asked me to do. If somebody cannot uh, interact with me in a one-on-one in -on -one setting, then I'm going to say we're incompatible, right? Uh, if you really, by the way, if there's anyone here who only wants to uh, work through technology, we've got a priest in our diocese. He's a good guy. Uh, he can't do one-on-ones. Uh, he just, he gets... He's, he gets anxious. He's, he's uncomfortable. He's phenomenal on the internet. Um, and so mostly that's what he does all day. He answers people's questions online. Uh, that's his gift. So uh, that might be a case where you might be incompatible with me. You might really enjoy him. All right. But let's say, yeah, we're going to invest the time and we're going we're gonna to work on this growing. So uh, my next question is, if we're doing that and we're still having problems, then I'm going to ask, have we outgrown each other? Sometimes that happens. Uh, sometimes we uh, meet up in a relationship. There's a, great, um, there's a great time of growth. But then at a point, you realize that uh, what you have to offer and the way the person's growing has kind of met a limit. Have we outgrown each other? Um, I uh, had one time a spiritual daughter. Uh, we worked a lot on healing. And I uh, worked a lot on being understood as a beloved daughter of the Father. Uh, that's really kind of uh, in my wheelhouse in terms of uh, what I understand or what I'm able to offer. When she grew through that, uh, she became like this deep mystical prayer. And uh, had, the, had these, these wonderful prayer experiences, uh, these really vivid kind of, uh, uh, not like daydreams, like visions, you know, these really vivid images 
And I realized that uh, we were starting to stretch beyond uh, what I knew I could do in terms of helping her understand it, helping her live it. Uh, I always tease. She's a Carmelite sister now, uh, Sister Marie Benedicta. I always tease. So I once was her director, but now she directs me. Um, yeah, honesty. Have we outgrown each other? Have we maxed out what we can do here in terms of how we're growing? Um, so I, I, I missed this one, but yeah. If there's not a desire, there's not a willingness to invest that time, uh, then you can say, okay, I'm going to let this thing go. Uh, if, if we're working on it, we're trying to find something fresh, we're trying to find something to deepen, and there's nothing there, it's kind of underwhelming. Uh, I'm really surprised that this is the limit, but this is, this is where we are. Um, I want to go deeper, the other person just doesn't have that capacity, there's nothing there, then I'm going to let it go. Uh, if I'm willing to invest the time and I keep doing it, then I'm going to find that, that growth. I'm going to find that, that place uh, where we do find that compatibility where we are together. And if that's the case, then I'm going to go back over to the yes sign, right? So that's how you save a friendship. If it's out of balance, if there's, if there's these problems, if you keep fighting your way through it and you get to the point where you do desire that growth and you fight for it and you do find it, uh, then you're back over to the yes. How do we deepen it? Okay, so that, that's kind of my uh, yes-no uh, flow chart. I'm going to go through just a, a couple more uh, slides that are some practical things. When you're on the no side, when I'm saying have a nice life, when I'm saying I'm going to let it go, we'll go through a few practical ideas about how to do that, and then, uh, then we'll do some questions. All right, so how do we end a bad friendship? How are we going to let it go? I've got some general stuff, then I've got some specific rules. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to say trust God. It's probably one of the hardest things when you're in a difficult situation. How do you trust that God's going to bring your heart to fulfillment? Uh, we, uh, it's probably one of our struggles as fallen humanity. We want to have control as best we can, whenever we can. Uh, it is hard to let go. So, a lot of times, we'll hold on to something that's bad, because even though it's bad, we feel like we at least have that control there. Uh, of course, the reality is much better to, to let God take care of us, to give that up. There's a risk involved, right? If I give up this relationship, there's a risk involved, but I'm going to trust God that He's going to take care of my heart. He's going to bring me to fulfillment. Whatever I give up, I'm going to trust that God is going to bring back to me in a better way. Uh, this is practical, but um, I think be honest in the beginning and resist uh, deepening a bad friendship in the beginning. It's the easiest time to let go. Um, I always say, uh, you know, if you're in a situation where you know you need to move on, uh, there's no easier day to do that than today. The longer you hold on, the harder it is. Uh, no easier day to make the break than right now. And then I think reason must rule. Uh, we have to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of things that can kind of creep their way in there. You want to watch for those. Possessiveness, selfishness, jealousy, not listening, pretending, uh, not being able to be our true selves. Uh, the person can't be them tr their true selves with us. Dangerous expectations, boundary problems, initiative troubles. Um, you know, if you're the, the one that always makes the call, uh, there's, a, there's a little trouble there. It's out of balance. Um, I had to talk, I got, I got a great relationship with my mom and dad. Uh, they've been really supportive. They've been really good to me through the years. They've been really understanding. Uh, but we got in a pattern for a long time where the only communication we had was if I called them. And yeah, I'm a pretty busy guy. i got a lot going on schedule-wise. Um, let's say that, you know, for me, quite a few days go by before I call them. Uh, there's no contact at all. That was actually an honest conversation we had to have once. Uh, how come you guys never call me? Or... How come I always come home to visit, but you never come to visit me where I live? Um, that was now in their case, they're farmers. They've got you know chores, animals. They're they're very much tied to the home place. But it was an honest question, which for us we were kind of out of balance. It actually helped us get back on balance. We set some reasonable expectations. All right, when is a good time for us to talk? And let's make that effort then. And if I don't call right away. Uh, then, then my dad calls. Uh, it's actually pretty nice now. Um, yeah, my dad calls. Sometimes he just calls me to tell me that the neighbor's cow's out or whatever. Um, it's actually kind of pleasant, right? Yeah. 
so yeah, initiative troubles, right? Are you the one that always starts everything? Are you the one that always makes the call? Uh, if that's true, okay, we're, we're probably pretty out of balance here. Those are things to watch for. Uh, especially, want to watch for manipulation. This is a really difficult. Um, I am allergic to manipulative people. Um, I've been in a couple of situations now. The 50 text message things is an example I'm going to use. I've been in a couple of those that have been uh, pretty severe. Uh, I'm really on the watch for that now. Uh, I, I, that's something that I'm always going to want to uh, really stop uh, early on before it gets too bad. These are the things that manipulative people are going to try to do. They're going to try to make deals. They're going to try to change the rules. They're going to play on emotion. They're going to threaten punishment, right? So um, this person texts me 50 times a day and I... I have the honest conversation. I say, we're out of balance here. Uh, your needs exceed uh, what I can provide. Uh, I think, I'm going to be honest here, I think 50 text messages a day are too much. So, what does the manipulative person do? Uh, okay, well, how about 40? And I said, well, how about zero? Right? I don't want to make a deal. If I make a deal, then that person still has power, right? Uh, that person's still in control if I make a deal. Uh, rule changes. Uh, what if instead of uh, texting, we do a call every day, right? I'm not going to text you anymore if I can talk to you on the phone every day. Rule changes. Uh, play of emotion. Uh, didn't you make a promise to God to help people grow? Isn't that part of your promise as a priest? Uh, aren't you, a, you know, if you're going to be a good priest, you have to help me? Uh, threats. If you don't help me, I'm going to say that you're a bad priest. I'm going to say that you did some bad thing. Or I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say that, you know, that, uh, you know, that, yeah, that you did something hurtful. I'm going to tell everybody. Or uh, if you don't answer it, I'm going, to, I'm going to call even more. I'm going to call 100 times a day. Or I'm going to text 100 times a day. Those are the kinds of things that manipulative people will do. Got to be very careful about that. Uh, pro you know, protect ourselves. Um, Nobody should have to, to be in that situation. That to me is, I hope all of that sounds that way, right? That to me is uh, the definition of, of what would fall under destructive or abusive, right? Now, there's nothing that can be fruitful in a situation like that. There's no honest dialogue, and there's, there certainly is no mutual good being considered. Uh, sometimes people uh, ask the question like, you know, isn't it part of my Christian duty to help this person grow, right? Shouldn't I... Shouldn't I stick around? I've got this friendship, these, uh, I've got these uh, whatever, uh, these drinking buddies, and they just go overboard. It's, it's a big problem. Uh, but shouldn't I stick with them? Because I want to help them grow. I want to make sure that, you know, that they, they see good and that they, they keep fighting for it in their lives. Uh, my response to that is, that could be fine. Uh, but be honest about what your capacity is. What are you able to do? What, it, what are you able to provide um, that is safe and sound from your standpoint, right? If you're putting yourself in a dangerous spot, if you're becoming uh, in a precarious spot, uh, then you know that it's too dangerous. Um, when you fly an airplane, uh, what do they tell you, right? Whenever, if, if the airplane runs into trouble, the mask's going to fall down and they always say, put yours on first and then help the person next to you, right? Uh, so we have to be honest about that. How... How strong am I really? Am I able to handle this difficult situation on an ongoing basis? If I, if I can, then yeah, jump in there and, and be that good Christian man and woman who helps lead others to Christ. If it's too overwhelming and it drags you in and you find yourself falling into sin or whatever, then we've got to be honest and say, okay, I'm not ready yet. I've got to go back and get some oxygen, right? Back to the chapel. I think the voice is going here. <coughs> Um, so you gotta that's to me something to be honest about protecting yourself tonight's talk is sponsored by Cranberry Line Propel <laughs> it is refreshing <laughs> there's four basic paths for ending a friendship the first one pretty passive unintentional withdrawal so as I mentioned, a lot of friendships are based on proximity, so I'm just going to kind of let this one fade. We're going to go home at the, end of the, at the end of the school year, 
and I just won't see that person anymore. Or uh, we're going to graduate and go our separate ways. Or uh, wherever Kanji wants to live, it's not here. He's going to move and we'll just kind of gradually drift apart, right? So that's a very passive way of ending a relationship. Um, I'm going to call that unintentional withdrawal. I'm just going to kind of let it fade. Um, can be really easy, but also sometimes can lack closure, right? If there's something that between me and Kanji, we really need to work it out before he moves away. And if I can't work it out, I'm not going to be settled about it. That's probably not my method, right? I, if I need closure, that's probably not going to be my method. If, it's, if we don't have that much at stake, and there's not really something specific that I'm desiring to know or figure out, then maybe that would be my best bet. I'm just going to kind of let that one go. Uh, next one up, intentional avoidance. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm calling that passive-aggressive. Um, I'm going to purposefully avoid the person. I'm going to purposefully uh, stay away. Um, that can work because there's no, we don't have a confrontation. We don't have an un uncomfortable meeting. But, as I also say, it can restrict freedom, right? It can take away um, my living my life, who I am. Uh, if Kanji and I get in a fight and we decide that we're going to avoid each other, that's going to be really difficult because we both work here in the same building. And so, if we're going to avoid each other purposefully, we're going we're to be in trouble, right? He's going to be in trouble because uh, I run some meetings that he's supposed to be attending. <laughs> um, yeah, it can restrict freedom. It, it could be hard for me to be who I am if I'm avoiding uh, a certain, certain person purposefully. Number three, this is probably my go-to method, uh, intentional analysis. When I run into trouble in a relationship, this is usually where I go to. And I'll be honest, I, I am at a point in my life where I'm pretty secure in who I am. I'm living this life. I know who I am. Uh, but I also am pretty secure in knowing what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are. So I can be pretty honest uh, in a conversation. Um, reason takes the lead. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practically walk through. A lot of times, this is exactly what I do. Uh, we're having trouble in our relationship, and I think it's out of balance, and this is why I think it's out of balance, because every time we get together, all you do is talk about money for three hours, and I'd rather talk about growing hearts and how to help people heal and draw closer to the kingdom. Uh, so we're out of balance here. Can we remedy it? Or if you would really rather just talk about finances, then... Maybe there would be someone else you could, you could call instead of me. Intentional analysis. Uh, what's nice about that one is it's oftentimes very much easier to get closure, right? It's easy for me and that guy to go our separate ways because I can say, you know, he's a great guy. He's really passionate about the business aspect of a parish, and he is doing great with it. Uh, it's not my forte. It's not my passion. It is his. And that's okay. Uh, he can go and do his thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do mine. I can have closure on that. We can, we can have a nice, uh, sensible parting and uh, can continue to be uh, maybe at that casual level without any, without any hard feelings at all. Last path is an unresolvable conflict. conflict. Uh, contact is really unhealthy and there's, there's nothing else that can be done. Uh, this yeah, could be a lot of times like an abusive situation. A lot of times others do have to step in. And when they do, then usually our control or our, our ability to kind of end it ourselves or figure it out ourselves is no longer possible. Uh, I'm always hopeful that we don't end up in those kinds of conversa conversations very often or those situations very often. Uh, but it may just be, it may be a situation. There's nothing we can do. We can't see eye to eye. Every time we're together, it's just yelling and screaming. Uh, there's no listening. There's no understanding. There's nothing else I can do. I got to just say, we can't resolve this thing. I got to let it go. Uh, that's a place where probably uh, we need, that we're going to have to go to God for that uh, with some healing and trust, forgiveness and mercy that's going to be able to, to help our hearts come to peace. Okay. So those are kind of my, my four paths. Uh, what would be some rules, uh, depending on what path you choose? Before anything else, it has to be an act of the will. I got to convince myself that I can and I will break up. I've done the analysis. This friendship is not healthy for me. It's not one in which I can grow. It's not one in which I can be inspired or another person can be inspired. Uh, I have to make the, the willful decision that I'm going to end this thing. It's going to stop right here. Uh, I could listen to this dude. I'm, I'm using this example because it's kind of an easy one. It's kind of obvious. Uh, I could listen to this guy talk about finances for the rest of my life. 
but I don't want to. And so I need to be honest about that. I need to say, uh, you know what? I am not going to sit through three hours again of the school thing, the school finances. I'm going to call this thing. I'm going I'm to be done with it. First and foremost, act of the will. I can do it, and I will do it. <laughs> I don't know where I found this on the internet. Um, I think I, uh, I think I googled "I can do it" pics or something like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So here's some rules for ending a bad friendship. First rule is to separate physically. Uh, this is Father Gerald Kelly, by the way. Um, no dates, calls, correspondence. He says, I think very smartly, you cannot discipline emotion while constantly feeding it on the things that stimulate it. Uh, if I am trying to calm myself down about uh, this friend you know, who's always talking finances, uh, you know what I can't do? Read their parish report, right? <laughs> Look up his bulletin online. You know, ask other priests, you know, how, how's their school doing? No. If I'm doing all that, I'm still feeding, I'm still feeding the attachment. Um, we have to be willing to separate. Beware of the just one more. This is not just true in this setting. This is true in any moral setting. Uh, how many times in my life have I said, just one more donut, and then I'm really going to quit, right? Uh, just one more uh, cheat day, then I'm really going to go back to being disciplined. Just one more day of sleeping in, and then I'm going to start my new morning routine. Uh, beware of just one more. It's, it's, it's always going to be trouble for us. Uh, we're fallen, a fallen human nature. Uh, we need structure. We need discipline. If we give ourselves that leeway in our fallen situation, we're probably going to take it. And so we need to be uh, careful about the just one more. And I say here, keep a closed door closed. If you're going to break it off, Keep a closed door closed. Uh, just one more conversation. Uh, just one more. Just one more. Just one more. And if we do that, it, it may never really be gone. Uh, it's always going to be hanging on if we keep opening the door again. And then practically, in terms of that physical, uh, make sure that you're not isolating, right? Be with other people. Uh, if you're going to let go of one relationship, there's going to be some grieving there. And so we need others to kind of help buffer that, that, the blow. <laughs> it's amazing. When you just start Googling stuff, you find anything. Yeah. Second, separate mentally. Don't constantly be feeding your imagination with reminders. You know how our mind works, right? Do not think of a purple elephant. Don't think of a purple elephant. Whatever you do, don't think of a purple elephant. When we try to force ourselves not to do it, oftentimes, I'm sure, right? Whenever I said, don't think of a purple elephant, you probably all in your mind thought, oh, I guess that's what that one would look like. Um, <laughs> there's no such thing as a purple elephant. And yet, we all had a picture of one in our minds. Right? That's how our mind works. Uh, if we are feeding the mind, um, then it's going to keep churning. And when it, does, it works positively or negatively. Uh, I say at the end here, don't start hating the person. Uh, it really is a way of continuing to be attached. Um, if I start developing this hatred for this person who texts me like 50 times, then that person's never, I'm really not free of that person, right? Uh, I'm still, my heart is still engaged. And in fact, I'm still hurting my, now in this case, I'm hurting myself uh, because I won't let that go. Uh, same thing can happen if we really turn into self-pity. Uh, if the heart gets turned inward, for us as Christian people, we're in trouble. Our hearts are made for love. Our hearts are made to be turned out. If our hearts get turned inward, then isolation. Uh, it's dangerous for us. Father uh, Kelly says, get rid of reminders, letters, pictures, etc. I still remember, um, it was a hard day for me at seminary. One of the things that we did was, um, we, a uh, couple of buddies of mine, um, I don't know, we were probably like second or third year in, and it was pretty clear in my heart, uh, I was going to be a priest, I knew that. And uh, so the question came up, why are you still holding on to all those pictures of Katie Schiffer? You know, why do you still have those in your desk drawer? Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, why am I still hanging on to that if I know that that's not the life God has laid out for me and that's not the life I'm going to live? Um, it was actually a really freeing moment 
to let those go. And now what's really fun is I've got other pictures of her now, like with her family. Uh, it's really cool because, uh, yeah, it keeps me free. I like that very much. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do, but that is sometimes a very physical letting go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of this picture or I'm going to get rid of this note. And that's going to be a real physical letting go. That's how I'm going to uh, remind myself that I am moving on. Third one, keep a balanced mental attitude. I couldn't resist, so this is the best hair in the business right here. <laughs> Father Mike Schmitz. Have you ever seen him talk? He always goes like this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was in Nashville last winter. Uh, I was at a talk with a couple of people who know me really well. And uh, we finished the talk and the person turned to me and said, Father Luke, that is exactly how you talk. What he said is exactly what you always tell me. And I'm like, yeah, the only difference between me and him is the hair. <laughs> uh, we have to keep a balanced mental attitude, right? So I am quietly but firmly convinced that I'm moving forward. No compromising by seeking foolish outlets. That is exactly the wrong thing to do, right? I'm feeling kind of down in the dumps, so I'm going to get Father Jim to take me out for a pizza, and then we're going to drink too much, and I'm just going to forget about the whole thing. It's, it's not, not a healthy outlet. Um, if we turn into things that are, for us, dangerous or for us, hurtful by going too overboard in those things, um, then we're not gonna, our hearts are not going to be free, and we're going to continue to drive ourselves uh, deeper into uh, being constricted by that, that hurt. Um, so, that, I mean, that goes back to the beginning. We can't make a bad choice because we're hurting. We can't make a bad choice uh, morally because we're sad. Um, the only solace that we have is to go to Him, to go di deeper into the cross to understand how He wants to set us free. Uh, keeping a sense of humor is very important. Uh, sometimes that's something that really helps us to de-stress in the moments. Um, and then the last one, uh, don't take vocation thoughts too seriously. Uh, it's very normal. I had a buddy in seminary. Uh, he was uh, dating a woman and uh, asked her to marry him. She said no. Uh, he threw the ring in the river and then drove to the seminary. Uh, you know, in the moment, maybe that was kind of an emotional escape or an emotional moment. But uh, he didn't last. Uh, you know, after, after his heart healed, after he calmed down, he realized uh, it was just a reaction in the moment. You know, well, you know, I guess if I'm not getting married, I might as well go be a priest or something. Nah. Uh, beware of vocation thoughts. Uh, when our hearts are hurting, is not a good time to figure out our vocation, right? Uh, when we're discerning a vocation, our hearts should be healthy, uh, growing, connected with God. Uh, there used to be a good rule of thumb is you should always make a vocation decision when your prayer life is as strong as it's been, right? So when your heart is healthy and close to God, that's the time to take those, um, to make those decisions. Okay, I think we've got a, a few minutes left. Do you want to do any questions? Let's see some questions. Uh, or if anyone has anything written down, we can pass them in. Yeah, Austin? Do you have any practical tips um, for how we can generally assess friendships in our own life? Yeah, um, I, you know, the reason I use kind of this, this yes-no kind of flow chart is because I think it keeps it pretty easy. Um, but yeah, you know, practical things that you want to look at is, uh, is there, uh, for me, always the growth and inspiration, right? Does, does being with this person help me want to be better? You know, am I inspired to, to be better, to keep growing? Uh, to me, that's always going to be like the simplest question. Uh, you can take it to the next level. You can ask things like, uh, compatibility or interest, you know, is there enough of a shared interest here that we want to keep going? Um, but that's, I would probably always go both first to that inspiration and growth, because uh, that usually encompasses everything. If you share interests and you have fun together, then you're going to feel like there's support and growth there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're on like the note side, and but you like still have the desire for that friendship, yeah. How do you like deal with that? Yeah. So it's kind of, it's not by accident that we have kind of two paths here on the no side. Um, so uh, you'll notice on this side, it always ends with have a nice life, right? And those, those are really kind of the dead ends. This is not going any further. But on the other side, yeah, if you want to keep fighting for it, you can. You can. But I always caution and make sure that you're honest about what you're fighting for. Uh, I don't want to just be hanging on just for the sake of hanging on. Uh, if there really is good here, there's potential. 
Um, like you could go over here to some of these questions. Like you could say, um, like, is this a person that I would want to be friends with for life? And you might say, honestly, I'm not sure right now. Uh, there's some things that you know are pretty uncomfortable or pretty difficult. But you could say, do I see the potential there? Could this person keep growing to a point where then I would say, yeah, maybe I do want this friendship for life? So if you're on the no side, but you want to keep making the effort, and it's not harming you, and you realize that there's still some potential there, then I think you keep fighting for it down through, right? So you do invest the time uh, to keep working on it. Uh, you do decide that we got to keep growing. We have to keep growing deeper. And then if you do that, yeah, then all of a sudden you realize, I'm actually back on the yes side. You know, we're, we are growing together. Um, but if you get to this point and there's a dead end, or you get to this point and there's no more mutual effort or no more mutual growth, then you probably have kind of hit, hit a dead end, if that makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, that's a dreaded one. Um, yeah, that one's just as bad as it's not you, it's me. Uh, yeah, it's probably my favorite Seinfeld uh, moment with George. Uh, the, the girl's breaking up with him and she says, George, it's not you, it's me. He's like, it's not you, it's me. I invented it's not you, it's me. Don't give me it's not you, it's me. And then she's like, it's right, it's you. And he's like, you're darn right, it's me. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that is a hard one. Uh, sometimes that happens. What if you think that the relationship should, should go further, but the other person does not? Uh, so uh, that's why the first question is, are both, are both growing, right? So we have to be honest about that. Sometimes Friendships sometimes are uh, more, by their nature, more one-sided. Uh, in a, in a, a relationship like uh, Rob here, he's one of my spiritual sons, we've been growing through the years. Our relationship by its nature has been more one-sided all the way along, right? So uh, I'm, I'm helping him. You know, there's some mutual support there, right? Like when I'm rehabbing my torn hamstring, he goes and he does laps in the pool with me and we race, to, you know, to kind of push me uh, to heal. Uh, there's, some, there's some mutual sharing there, but it's probably a little more one-sided by nature, right? Some relationships are like that and that's okay if that satisfies both people. Um, if you're at a spot where one person wants more than the other, or if it's out of balance, uh, then, I, then I think we've got to start asking the questions, right? Why is it out of balance? And can we fix that balance, if that makes sense? Um, probably the hardest thing about relationships is that uh, it involves somebody else, right? We can give everything we have. I, I can give everything I've got to be a deep, uh, good friend with Father Jim, but if he's just going to sit there and snore, <laughs> there's nothing I can do yeah I, I desire that friendship as much as anything but if he's not willing we can't do it we can't go further uh, that's probably one of the hardest things uh, is that it does involve somebody else and they have to play their part also uh, both have to be invested if it's going to be fruitful yeah mm -hmm. yeah Rachel um, Yeah. Um, yeah, and I would say, uh, if you've got to take it off, feel free, by the way. So, um, how, uh, yeah, at what point is it detrimental to just have mostly casual relationships? Or uh, is it, are they only all casual? Uh, I think that would be a fair question. Uh, you can have as many casual friendships, you know, as you have a capacity for, right? How many names can you remember? Um, I think I'm at uh, 9,900, no, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, as many, as many uh, friendships as you have a capacity for, you can have, right, at, at a casual level. Casual friendships really don't cost us very much. There's not that much investment, so there's not that much cost. There's also not that much benefit. Uh, that might be kind of lighthearted, it might be kind of uh, relaxing, uh, but in terms of satisfying the deep needs of the heart, those are always going to fall short, right? So I would say maybe a couple things that just pop into my mind. If you find yourself, you know, with a casual friend, somebody who maybe you just know on a superficial level and all of a sudden you start asking them like deep questions of the heart and they freak out on you, um, that might be a, a realization that you probably do need more deep friendships or at least a, a deep friendship uh, to share some of those uh, deeper things with. 
Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, just ordinary living, uh, as long as you can handle it and as long as it doesn't cost you too much, there's really probably no limit that has to be there. Um, this lady in my parish in Bloomington, she used to say, Father, uh, I'm always amazed at how you remember people's names. And I said, well, you know, I really only remember the names of people I like. And uh, there was a long pause there, and she's like, I hope you know my name. <laughs> Thankfully, I did. Uh, I did have a moment of panic there. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Michael. Um, I've never really been comfortable talking on the phone. So, like, when you have that distance that comes from, you know, people moving away or saying new jobs, like, yeah. if you're not comfortable with, like, telecommunication, like, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And it's, like, not really feasible to go see them really often. What would you say? Yeah. So that's a good question. So yeah, uh, the, the one person moves, you're not comfortable with talking on the phone, what are you going to do? Uh, so you know, that, could be an that could be an honest place where you say like, you know, the needs and the gifts don't match anymore or the, the capacity doesn't match. Um, if you're willing, if you want to keep that friendship, if you want to fight for it, then you'll make the investment, right? So even though you know, FaceTime is not my thing, uh, if I really care about this friendship and I want to fight for it, I'm going to be willing to try it. Does that make sense? Um, if, that, if that friendship is, is, to me, not worth that effort, or if I'm not willing to make that effort, then that tells you it probably is you know, one of these um, proximity-based. You know, it's either it's a casual one, or uh, it's one that's just based on our time together here, and then that would fade over time. Yeah. And that's okay to let those go if... Um, if we, if we let one of those go, we understand that our heart would be free for something else, that God could bring something else to our hearts. And so, um, yeah, that's just fine to do. Uh, I've been in now uh, five, five assignments, five different places. I've always found that in each of those places, there's a few hearts that stay with me. Uh, there's people that I still keep up with that still send me Christmas cards, you know, from my first parish or my second parish. Uh, from my last parish, there's a couple of families that I'm still pretty close with. Uh, I see them, call them, they, they come here for dinner, I go there to visit them sometimes. But there's 3,000 other families that I never hear from or that I never talk to, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, it, it is just fine to let some of those fade. Uh, and you trust that, when you do that, that God's going to bring you others, uh, other friendships, other deep. Yeah. Yeah, Katie. <coughs> The difference between sacrifice and destruction? Yeah. Ooh, I like that question. So uh, for me, uh, sacrifice is free. It's freely given. And it also, uh, it might cost me, but it's not going to harm me. Um, yeah, uh, not harm me in a way that's maybe ir irreparable. So uh, destruction, uh, to me, would, sl would slip into that abuse situation because what's being asked for is more than what I can offer. Um, it's one of my adages. I used to always say this to the, uh, the service uh, and justice uh, folks. Um, it's unjust. If somebody asks you for something more than you can offer, it's actually unjust of them to offer, ask that, right? So if a guy comes in and demands that I pay his you know, $1,000 rent, it's actually unjust. I don't have $1,000 to give you know, to charity for rent. Uh, so if he demands it from me, it's actually it's not right. It's unjust for him to demand that to me. Um, uh, if he asks me for an amount, 20 bucks, and that's within my capacity, then I have an opportunity to sacrifice it or to be generous. Um, so to me, uh, that would be, would be the distinction. Is, um, is it harmful to me in a way that, that I can't uh, repair or overcome? Yeah. Okay, Kanji. Uh, so you, you kind of give a good example when you're talking. So my question is, if you, what do you do in situations where you don't necessarily have full freedom to completely exit the relationship, to completely say have a nice life? You give the example like you and me, you know, we're still going to work together, so um, you know, we don't quite have that full freedom to exit. Or maybe yeah. it's a family member or a, a friend who's mutual friends with somebody who you're close to, and so you're going to see them on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have in those situations? Yeah, if, if, there isn't, uh, if there isn't a natural escape, uh, then I would go back when I did those the kind of four pathways. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're going to see the person 
and uh, you got to be interacting together, whatever, then to me, probably that third pathway is where you got to go. Uh, we got to sit down and say, all right, look, Kanji, I don't like you. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. We got, we got to sit down. We have to reason through it, right? Uh, okay, here's the problem we're having. We're different people. We've got different passions, different likes, whatever. We're probably not going to get along, but for the good of this place, we're going to work together in this way, right? So I'm going to choose. It's an act of the will. I'm going to choose to work together in this way, and I'm going to choose to be okay with it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, sometimes stuff like that has to happen. Uh, I had it in my family. Uh, I had an uncle who once was a priest and left the priesthood. And uh, sometimes at our family gatherings, there's all these awkward like church conversations, right? Uh, bad stuff about the church or bad stuff about the priesthood or whatever because of this other situation. Uh, so I'm in a situation where uh, I'm going to be honest and I'm going to say, all right, if I'm at this family reunion, I am not going to talk about bad church things. If you want to talk about good church things, okay. You want to talk about Illinois sports, okay. Uh, you want to talk about, you know, the, the cows on the farm, okay. I'll do that, but I'm not going to talk about bad church things. And so I, I can kind of set my ground rules in terms of what's acceptable to me. Uh, then we have an opportunity for them to prove, you know, will they abide by it or will they not? So, um, yeah, then I would take it to the next level or whatever. Um, but that's, that's overall, generally, that's how I would handle that. Yeah. Amanda, did you have one? Uh, do you think it's possible for people who break up, like if you have a bad like dating relationship, can you have a good platonic relationship? Yeah. So, yeah, can you, can you back it up? Right. Once a friendship has gone into the dating situation, it's, been, it's gone bad, can you back it up? Um, I would say it's possible. Uh, it's pretty hard, though. Most people probably are not willing either to make the effort or the investment or whatever sacrifice would be needed to overcome it. Um, I did have, this is amazing, uh, this is sort of related, uh, I had a, a couple one time, they had a wonderful group friendship, there was like six of them, great friends, and she developed this really serious crush on him, and decided that in order for her heart to be free, she needed to tell him, well, it totally took him by surprise, he wasn't ready for it, he rejected it, uh, which really made the group thing really awkward, right? Um, and so that was, we met together, and that was one of the questions was, can we save this thing? Uh, it's, it's made a change now, it's gone bad, can we save this? My response was, if this friendship is of God, and if it's of value to you, and you want to fight for it, then fight for it, right? And if you want to fight for it, then you can, you can save it, if, if you both do. Uh, so not only did they recover, but it was pretty cool. About three months later, he thought, oh, maybe she is kind of nice. And uh, actually, they're married now with a couple of kids. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty cool story. Uh, most people probably find it too burdensome. Uh, it's too hard uh, to make that investment. Uh, sometimes, as I, you know, I said, practically, keep a closed door closed. Sometimes it's just too hard. Even though we've said our friendship's just going to be at this level, I always want more. I always want to go back you know, to where it was. And if, if we can't abide by the rules that we set or if it's unhealthy for our hearts to do it, then that's probably where we need to be honest and say, all right, you know, we had, we had a good run here, but have a nice life. Yeah. All right. Is that good? All right, let's pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Blessing of Almighty God descend upon you and remain with you forever, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Everybody have a good night.